This is CBC Here and Now. There was two friends of mine in that play. I know them like for 10 years. Tonight, it's one of the deadliest air disasters involving Canadians, and for some, it's too close to home. 176 people killed near Tehran, 63 of them Canadians. My father holds me tight and kissed me, and my mom was just very emotional. This Memorial University student was almost on board that flight, but she made last-minute travel change plans. Here and Now has her story from Iran. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain and we begin a world away in the immediate aftermath of a devastating plane crash that has sent shockwaves throughout the country, including here in Newfoundland and Labrador. As I said, 176 people are dead, 63 of them Canadians, and it's believed that nearly half of those Canadians are from Edmonton. The Ukrainian International Airlines flight went down shortly after takeoff and there were no survivors. <laughs> The Boeing 737-800 went down minutes after taking off from Tehran's main airport on a flight to Kiev. The cause of the crash has not been determined, but Iranian state TV says both of the plane's flight recorders have been recovered. The airliner was only three years old and had undergone routine maintenance just two days ago. Many on board were students who were on their way back to Canada after the holiday break. Iranian Canadians commonly fly between Toronto and Tehran with a stopover in Kiev. Well, here in St. John's, people are watching this story carefully. There were no Newfoundlanders or Labradorians on board that flight, but there are friends of the victims here. Here now is Peter Cowan reports. Matis Terezoda was shocked when she woke up this morning to news of a plane crash in her home country of Iran. But then the news got even worse. I saw the list of people and there was two friends of mine in that play. I know them like for 10 years. That was, that was a really difficult moment I love. All day she's been watching the images of the crash, the body bags filled with dozens of Canadians and thinking what it's been like for their families. I'm pretty sure that they had sad moments saying goodbye to their families and like in that airport, you know, and there was no hello again. Many people on that flight were home for the holidays, visiting family, and then making the long and difficult journey back to Canada to return to school. Because of sanctions, airline choice is limited. Ukraine International was one of the few affordable ways to fly home. Terizoda said she's just like them. She moved to Canada for school and is just 10 weeks away from becoming a permanent resident. You know, I can't stop thinking that I could have been in that plane or I could have been in that path. Because by myself, I'm my life journey was pretty similar to the most like we are all students more than 90 percent of us are you know came here to canada by a student visa and we are like our life journey is pretty similar to each other so that was not difficult for me to put my myself in their position this crash comes as tensions have been mounting between iran and the united states after the killing of a top iranian official in iraq She's hoping peace will continue. It's hard to see her family and friends suffer. They are struggling, but for us, it, it could be more difficult to watch them struggling. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, one PhD student at Memorial University has been watching this story unfold with absolute horror. Bahar Hagigat flew home to Iran for the holidays, and she was supposed to be on that flight to Kiev, but decided to change her booking at the last minute. My father holds me tight and kissed me and my mom was just very emotional. And quickly afterwards, they were like, we cannot imagine how the fam how family of those uh, who were on that plane feel. The airport is far from like cities and we imagine that those like parents and those who uh, said goodbye to their loved ones. Uh, they were on their way go to back home and they heard this horrible, horrible news. Now we'll have more on the local connections to this big international story coming up in about 20 minutes on here and now, but also some context amidst that horrific crash, airstrikes on U.S. military bases in Iraq. 
This just hours before that passenger plane went down near Tehran, multiple missiles were fired. One target was Assad west Al Assad west of Baghdad. The other attack was on Erbil in northern Iraq. So far, there are no reports of any casualties. Canadian military personnel are said to be safe. The missile strikes were retaliations for the assassination of senior military commander General Qassem Soleimani. Now, the Prime Minister is speaking this hour. More from Ottawa as well as we get more reaction from the Iranian community in this province later in the show. I'm sure that this is sad news for a lot of people. Still to come tonight, scientists are revealing the latest cod stock numbers and things do not look good for the fishery on the south coast of Newfoundland. New information tonight on the Carla Foot fiasco at the rooms. A qualified candidate was paid to stay silent after the individual was let go. The termination paved the way for Foot to land a high paying position at the rooms. Here now is Ryan Cook has the details. In my hands is proof of something that's been suspected for a long time. We knew that another person had been hired to fill the vacant marketing director role at the rooms and they were terminated. But now we know that that person was paid to stay quiet. $20,000. This is the invoice showing what taxpayers coughed up for government to settle this situation. It came with a non-disclosure agreement ensuring nobody would talk about what happened. It also came with a promise not to sue. All of this was handled outside the courtroom. Tory leader Chess Crosby, a lawyer himself, isn't surprised. As far as I know, a lawsuit never was filed. It didn't need to be filed. The threat was enough. The government wanted to pay hush money to get this out of the public eye. That's what happened. And there's a confidentiality clause in the agreement. So, of course, it's all covered and shrouded in secrecy. So let's back up here. Carla Foote, the longtime Liberal staffer, was hired by Minister Chris Mitchellmore to run marketing here at the Rooms. Problem was, the Rooms CEO had already hired someone. Their name has been blacked out and never made public. That person had far more qualifications for the job, but the CEO was ordered by the Deputy Minister to fire them. Crosby says people should be outraged by this. And they should feel that it's an assault on our democratic system one of the principles of which is that government hiring is done on the basis of merit. And as I said, this takes that a step further. It takes it to the point where you can be fired if it's convenient to those in power, the Liberal government in this case, to make room for somebody they like better who's one of their own. We reached out to the Department of Tourism, Culture, Industry and Innovation this morning. As of late afternoon, we have not heard back. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Now, just moments ago, we did receive a response from the province. A spokesperson says the former CEO at the rooms, Dean Brinton, acted out of order when he hired the person in question. The contract was subsequently terminated and the person brought forward a claim letter. The province says the settlement follows, quote, standard government practices. Well, here's a live look outside our studios here in St. John's. That snow is uh, starting to move in or already has moved in. We're seeing uh, it heavy at times, road conditions certainly deteriorating. But if we take a look at the satellite and radar right now, we can see all that snow moving in along the west coast and then a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of a mess uh, heading in for the Avalon. We're already starting to see things change over to rain. Temperatures are already starting to climb. That's going to continue to do so as we head through the evening tonight. So things should change over to rain for a few hours and then back over to snow. And that's because the area of low pressure is just heading south of uh, Nova Scotia right now. That's going to continue to head over the island as we head through the night tonight. We do have a number of warnings in place. Here's a preview of those. I'll tell you how much snow we're expecting and the strong winds when I come back. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Some worrisome news from the fishery tonight. Cod stocks off the south coast of Newfoundland are at a critical level. The information comes from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which has changed the model that it uses to estimate cod numbers. The area, which is known as 3PS, extends from Cape St. Mary's to just west of Burgio. Scientists say even with no fishing this coming season, that stock will decline. Natural mortality, predators, a lack of food, as well as possible warmer water temperatures are all to blame for the decline.
everybody knows the stock is in a hard place. No matter what model we looked at, it was in a low place. So I'm sure that this is sad news for a lot of people. Um, but I don't think it's completely unexpected. When police investigators are trying to unravel the details of a home invasion in St. John's last night. Two people were involved in some kind of fight at around 9 o'clock in the city centre area. And police say there were injuries, but nothing that is considered life-threatening. Well, a Boxing Day fire on the west coast has revealed a shocker to some of the residents. Mattis Point doesn't have fire coverage. This is Tyler Bennett's home in the St. George's area about a year ago. And this is all that is left now after the December 26th fire. It turns out that the nearest fire department is four kilometers away in Stephenville Crossing, but it didn't respond to a call for assistance because fire service to Mattis Point was canceled about two years ago. Well, the mayor says not enough residents were paying for their share of those services, so the tough decision to opt out had to be made. Now the town is trying to find enough money to restore those services. Well, as we told you last night, the St. John's Edge playing their first home games of the season at mile one. The Edge are playing a two game series against the KW Titans. And last night, the home team came up big, beating the Titans 119 to 115. Nice game, close to 2,000 people showed up to see the Edge hit the court for their first time in their third season, but it wasn't an easy victory. The Edge had winter stressful times getting home after having two flights canceled, and they just managed to arrive in St. John's yesterday morning. Still, the team overcame that snow fatigue to pull off the win. Just got off a plane tw 10 hours ago, give up a big lead after, uh, after we do such a good job in the first half, and man, that was a gritty win. That was a gritty win. It tells a lot about the 11 guys in that locker room. Um, they just got it done, just got it done. It took us a little bit to get it going, but now that these guys have you know, gotten their feet wet in the league, they understand what's going on, only up from here. When getting around means walking on the road, what some people are going through because of all of that snow, snow, snow this week.
Do I think I could change? I think I can do anything if I want to. Am I gonna get out and do it? Am I gonna break the cycle? This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. These days it seems it'll always snow before you go, at least the way it's been uh, of late, and we're going to get to the weather in a bit. However, I mentioned earlier on the program, we're going to show you some people trying to get around town. Mm -hmm. Some pretty tough times for pedestrians out there. I want you to check out this dash cam video from earlier in the week showing a plow on Water Street West in the downtown. Yeah, and one not so fortunate pedestrian. Watch the right of your screen. The plow goes by and... And you'll see it again right here. Slowed down a bit, that pedestrian, the pedestrian right there. Goes down. Oof. Nasty surprise. Now, for its part, the city says that it is aware of this video. You can see it there with that guy on the right getting splashed over by the snow. A spokesperson says it's unfortunate that the pedestrian fell down and kind of pushed down. Nonetheless, the city hopes, obviously, the person wasn't injured, and they say that person can reach out to the city if they so wish. So if you hear a plow coming, be careful. And if you're driving a plow, slow down a bit. Yeah. It's hard. It's bad, yeah. Especially it's when bad. it gets um, wet. Oh. Yeah, and all that stuff coming down, of which there's more to come. There certainly is mm -hmm. more to come. Yeah, I showed you the satellite picture a little bit earlier. Let's take a look at that again, just to show you uh, what's happening right now. So we do have areas of snow moving in along the west coast and for uh, the Avalon as well. Now down through the southern portion of the Avalon that has uh, already changed over to rain and it's doing so quite quickly. That's going to head a little bit further north in the next, I'd say, hour or so. And uh, we should see some things change over to rain. Visibility across uh, the island pretty low. Uh, Stephenville showing 0.8 kilometer per hour or kilometers of visibility. And uh, that's just going to continue as we head through the overnight tonight as those winds uh, continue to ramp up. Here's where we're sitting winter storm wise. Winter storm warnings along the west coast through the interior, including Deer Lake. Uh, Green Bay, White Bay, the uh, Bay of Exploits, as well as Grand Falls winds are otherwise uh, gander now in a blowing snow advisory. So those winds are going to stay strong and then those strong winds uh, prompting a wind warning uh, for Bonavista North along the coast all the way through to the Avalon, including the Buren Peninsula. So winds really will uh, ramp up over the over the night tonight. We're actually going to see the center of the uh, low pressure system move over pretty much eastern Newfoundland. So when that happens, those winds are actually going to ease uh, near zero potentially uh, for parts of Bonavista North as that low moves in. In behind it though, that snow will uh, move back in with some stronger winds so that blowing snow will certainly be an issue uh, yet again. Here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise. Temperatures are going to climb for the Avalon in eastern Newfoundland up to about four degrees for St. John's. Uh, hovering around the zero degree mark eventually for Marystown and you'll see those temperatures climb for the west coast as well. Up through Labrador pretty quiet minus 27 for Lab City under clear skies for the most part and uh, generally northwesterly winds 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Flurries possible along coastal Labrador. You'll really see your winds ramp up as you head through the day tomorrow. So here's where we'll be sitting uh, by tonight, anywhere from 70 to 80 kilometers per hour across uh, the northern, pretty much the north, uh, northern portions of the island into Thursday morning. We'll uh, see a little bit of relief and then really ramp up. So gustiest winds look like they'll be in exposed areas along the northeast, 100 and 130 kilometers per hour, hence that uh, wind warning into uh, tomorrow afternoon. So as far as what we're expecting into Friday, things should actually uh, stay quite windy, unfortunately. So here's a look at that low pressure system as it moves off in behind there on Thursday. We're going to continue to see those snowy conditions along the west coast, but otherwise things are actually going to taper off. But those winds are going to stay strong through the day. That's certainly uh, going to be the story heading into uh, Friday morning. Here's where uh, the snowfall map tweaked it a little bit just to show potentially a little bit more snow, 30 to 50, uh, rather 20 to 30 centimeters of snow uh, through parts of the Bayvert Peninsula. Otherwise, we're looking at about 10 to 20 
and then again that snow will continue through tomorrow afternoon that's because those temperatures are drop right through the day now these are pretty much your morning highs they're going to drop like a rock through the day across the island and again staying quite windy those winds are going to ramp up along the coast as well coastal labrador uh, Cartwright is under a wind warning right now and you're going to see gusts anywhere from 60 to potentially 80 kilometers per hour, maybe even excess for that uh, as well. Otherwise, temperatures around minus 23 for Lab City tomorrow, minus 17 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. And it looks like those are going to stick around as we head through the next couple of days. So I'll have uh, the details looking forward coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, staying with the snow, dozens of centimeters, to put it mildly, have fallen in St. John's, which has led to some pretty clogged up streets. And you saw that fellow getting sprayed by the plow a few moments ago. Well, we wanted to see just how inconvenient all of this is for people who have to actually get around. I wanted to hear from them firsthand about what it's like to try to hoof it around town. So we sent here and now's Meg Roberts out to find out. A lot of snow has fallen in the past few days, and it looks like there's more on the way. But what does that mean for people whose only form of transportation is getting around on their own two feet? Well, today I'm going to find out. So I'm going to try to get to the bus stop across from the CBC on Westerland Road. And in order to do that, I would have to walk out into this traffic, or I guess I can climb the snowbank. All right, this is uh, not ideal, but uh, I've made it here to the bus stop and I, uh, I think that's my bus in the background. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, are you walking to school? I sure am. Uh, what do you think of the walk so far? Um, it's been pretty scary because, you know, there's a lot of snow banks everywhere and I've been tripping and falling and, um, that's making me quite nervous, actually. I guess what, what's part of the uh, trip to school is the most nerve-wracking? Um, well, there's a spot just down the road there on Elizabeth that there's no sidewalk at all, so you have to walk on the road, which is very, very scary when cars don't fully see you when they make the turn. No, no, I fall more than 50 times, and then now I understood how to walk in snow. Now this. This is a nice looking bus stop, uh-huh. Look at that. Are you walking home? Uh, yeah, I'm just walking to the bus. <laughs> Can I walk with you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so what do you think of the sidewalk conditions here? Uh, it's kind of, kind of annoying having to walk on the road and stuff, so it's like not the best. Do you ever feel like it's kind of dangerous or? Yeah, it can be when you're walking on like the, the busy roads and stuff, you know? Well, if I learned anything from that walk, it's to make sure I work on my balance and always have a good set of boots. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Checked my phone and I saw uh, many missed calls from my friends and messages and emails. And I saw that people asking if I'm okay. Oh, she booked a flight on the airliner that crashed in Iran last night, but at the last minute, she changed her mind. This Memorial University student story is next.
Getting back to our top story, the horrific plane crash in Iran that killed 176 people, 63 of them Canadian. Bahar, Bahar Hagigat was supposed to be on that plane, and she's a PhD candidate in education at Memorial University, and she is home for the holidays. We managed to reach her earlier today in northern Iran. I got up uh, early in the morning around 9 a.m. in Iran, and I checked my phone, and I saw uh, many missed calls from my friends and messages and emails, and I saw that people asking if I'm okay, if I'm still in Iran. And then I was just like uh, shocked at why people, and because of the situation between Iran and the United States, I thought maybe uh, United States just uh, bombarded us or something happened. Uh, so I checked the news and I... Uh, talk to my parents and then I realized oh there is a plane crash and and this is a Ukrainian plane crash and I was familiar with that because uh, it was among the options that I was looking for when I was checking different flights to come to visit my family in Iran so first I've booked it because uh, financially it was better but then I changed my mind and because I, I just checked some information about Ukrainian airlines and uh, I, I've read some comments about that it, uh, it's not very reliable, it's many cancellations and uh, this sort of stuff. So I just canceled my, not canceled, I, I've changed my mind and I didn't confirm my uh, ticket with Ukrainian airline and I changed it to Austrian. I'm so happy that I'm with my family and I have their support and uh, I, I told them, I told my parents that I booked this flight first and then I changed my mind. Uh, and we sat silently and just follow all the news and then I saw the pictures of all those who were on the plane and some of them were friends of my friends and most of them are like were Iranian students and um, so it was just very overwhelming. I felt overwhelmed. My father held me tight and kissed me and my mom was just very emotional and quickly afterwards they were like we cannot imagine how the fam how family of those uh, who were on that plane feel right now because the crash was like only a few hours after after the flight so just I think one hour and uh, the airport is far from like cities and we imagine that those like parents and those who uh, said goodbye to their loved ones they were on their way go to back home and they heard this horrible, horrible news about their uh, loved one. And I've heard that among uh, those passengers, they were uh, two young Iranian uh, who went, uh, who came to Iran to celebrate their wedding. And it was only three days after their wedding party. That's Bahar Hagigat in northern Iran. Well, here in St. John's, Iranians are watching closely as events unfold in their home country. Here now is Carolyn Stokes spoke with one Iranian who has been living in St. John's for the past few years. What's it like for you turning on the television and seeing the escalating tensions in Iran, seeing the tragedy of this plane crash? So much is happening right now. What does that make you feel like as someone who's from that area? I was really scared not just me I, I believe all Iranians all Middle Eastern people and I can say all the world even American people in Iran we have uh, a lot of radicals like in the US that push Trump to do something dangerous and uh, I was waiting for a 
react for a dangerous react last night they attacked two American stations but I was waiting for the more dangerous attack I believe a lot of um, extremists are pushing Iran um, su supreme leader to do something that I can say insane but uh, luckily they just a small attack and in the midst of all of these escalating tensions comes this tragedy this plane crash out of Tehran what went through your mind when you saw that on the news my condolences to Iran Canada and uh, Ukraine we lost uh, some of our most brilliant uh, talents the best of uh, our students from the best Iranian college I want to ask uh, Canada and Canadian people be with us in this hard situation and what do you mean by that be with you I believe in a hard situation it's our uh, honor duty that we help and feel other people who has problem so you hope Canadians empathize with Iranians right now yes exactly do you think they do I believe so well, the Canadian flag atop the Peace Tower on Parliament Hill has been lowered to half-mast in memory of the lies lost in that Tehran crash. And just moments ago, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered his condolences to everybody who lost loved ones and called for a thorough investigations. Here's part of what the Prime Minister had to say. Thank you for being here on such short notice. This morning, Canadians across the country were shocked and saddened to learn that a fatal plane crash outside of Tehran had claimed 176 innocent lives. At least 63 Canadians were on board, and a total of 138 passengers on that flight were connecting to Canada. All people who won't be coming home to their parents, their friends, their colleagues, or their family. A newlywed couple, a family of four, a mum and her two daughters, bright students, and dedicated faculty members. All had so much potential, so much life ahead of them. On behalf of all Canadians, I want to express my deepest condolences to those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Your loss is indescribable, and this is a heartbreaking tragedy. While no words will erase your pain, I want you to know that an entire country is with you. We share your grief. Now, we are learning more details about some of the Canadians who were killed in that plane crash. Many, as we have reported, were students and some families with young children heading back after the holiday break. And this tragedy is being felt right across the country by those who lost a family member, a friend, a work colleague, and other relationships. Simon Dingley has more. I've been thinking about why all of this is happening to people of Iran, all this tragedy. Hossein Amushai saw the news on his phone at 3 a.m. He hasn't slept since, crying throughout the day. Two close friends, Iman Gadarpana and his wife Paranaz, were on that flight. He spotted their names on an Iranian airport passenger list. They both were a lovely couple. Amushai says they worked in mortgages and were active in Toronto's Iranian community. He says they came to Canada about a decade ago. The couple was headed home after a holiday in Iran. I can't think of any other event uh, at this scale that has touched so many people. Like I go on my Facebook and Instagram and almost every friend I know here has lost a friend or a family member. In Winnipeg this afternoon, a vigil was held for the victims. Some were students here at the University of Manitoba. We are very sorry for, for this event and our hearts close with with them and their families.
At least 30 people on the plane are believed to have lived in Edmonton, among them Pedro Musavi and his wife Mojan, and their two children. The parents were faculty at the University of Alberta. One of my friends, uh, him, his wife, and his, his two young, young girls mm -hmm. uh, were, were killed. His girls were 9 and 14. Uh, it's like, how can someone put words to that? It's, uh, it's just terrible. Um, I can't imagine what, what their families are going through. This is the largest loss of Canadian lives involving an aircraft since Air India in 1985. Now many Iranian Canadian families face the ordeal of holding funerals for their loved ones. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto. In St. John's, the team won its home opener. We'll take you to mile one to see the first game back home. Talked about basketball before the break. Well, let's switch to winter sports now. A couple of families in Whitehorse are embracing winter and they have become the envy of hockey fans everywhere. And they've teamed up to turn their front yards into an outdoor rink with all of the amenities. And as CBC's George Maratos learned, they were inspired by their love of the game and the success of one particular UConn player. The front yards of Takini Duplex homes in Whitehorse aren't exactly spacious. That hasn't stopped two neighbors from building this ice rink right out their front door. Well, I think the inspiration originally came from when Dylan Cousins got traded to, or sorry, drafted to the, the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, there was a whole ignition of excitement within our family, and it, really, it was the kids that came out and said, Dad, we should just have an outdoor rink. Dylan had one when he grew up. We should have one too. <laughs> the rink has all your standards, two nets, lights, and smooth ice. But a closer look takes the outdoor rink to the next level. Jerseys are basically just an inspiration from the boys. Uh, you know, my youngest here plays hockey in town and uh, said, Dad, we've got to do something to kind of spruce it up a little bit. So he took his jersey off and we traced it out and uh, we started basically doing cookie style jerseys and putting our favorite teams on there. Yeah, well, I think that um, no, <laughs> the idea to bring the logo of the Montreal Canadiens Centre Heights was uh, something that we were pleased with. So my boys and I drew a big logo in the kitchen a few uh, weeks ago and we made it in order to be 
you know, put on the ice and pour water on it. <laughs> it's kind of cool, right? So. This project hasn't just been about building an outdoor rink. I think it's about imagining it and imagining it to bring a sense of uh, what is uh, winter about. Like to play together, to build a relationship with neighbors and to bring alive this uh, idea that uh, our winter is about playing sport outside, enjoying the, the cold and uh, to embrace it and uh, to spend nights having fun, passing pucks around. The rink has taken work. Hours have been poured into making the dream a reality. More hours have been spent playing on it. Um, really cool. <clears throat> yeah, really cool because we put a lot of work in it. Me, probably 13 hours. What was your favorite part of the rink? Probably the shirts. They're really cool. How often are you uh, out playing on this rink now that you have it right out your front door? Um, like every day and yeah, sometimes my friends come over like every day. Yeah, some of my friends say um, they really want to skate on it and they want one like this. They want a hockey rink um, like me. So it's, you know, it's really good to have a nice rink. With their first front yard rink a success, the families say being able to play hockey out your front door will now become an annual tradition. George Moratis, CBC News, Whitehorse. Is back in so I'm 30 years old. I spent about half my life in jail. More jail time for Philip Penn. To be honest with you, that's the life I live. It's just who I've been for so long. In Ottawa today, police were called to an early morning shooting in a residential neighborhood about one kilometer south of Parliament Hill. When officers attended the scene, they found uh, four uh, victims inside the residence. Uh, one victim succumbed to his injuries inside, and three others were transported to hospital in serious condition. 
Now, the condition of one of the three, a 15-year-old, has been upgraded to stable. One witness reported seeing medics remove the injured from the residence on stretchers, and she says she had never before seen them in that neighborhood. She and others say it's not the first time that there have been gun-related incidents in the area, noting that there has been gang and drug activity there before. A suspect remains at large, but police say the scene is now considered secure. Well, the United States is imposing new economic sanctions on Iran following Iranian missile attacks on bases housing U.S. troops in Iraq. But Washington is not planning to take military action against Iran. At a news conference today, U.S. President Donald Trump said no one was harmed in the attacks. CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has more. If Iran had wanted to kill Americans in last night's attack, it could have. But with no casualties, Iran gave the United States an off-ramp in the escalation towards war. Donald Trump took it. Iran appears to be standing down, which is a good thing for all parties concerned and a very good thing for the world. Trump promised more economic pain for Iran. The United States will immediately impose additional punishing economic sanctions on the Iranian regime. Trump called on NATO to have a greater presence in the Middle East. That matters to Canada, currently leading the NATO mission in Iraq. The president called on European nations to abandon their efforts to revive the Obama-era nuclear deal with Iran. From Republican lawmakers, praise and perhaps relief. As a superpower, we have the capacity to exercise restraint and to respond at a time and place of our choosing, if need be. I believe the president wants to avoid conflict or needless loss of life, but is rightly prepared to protect American lives and interests. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How y'all doing? But as administration officials briefed Congress today, Democrats continue to express doubts about the intelligence behind Donald Trump's decision to kill the Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani. This is the result of reckless actions by President Trump of military brinksmanship. President Trump recklessly assassinated Qasem Soleimani. He had no evidence of an imminent threat or attack. And we say that coming from a classified briefing where, again, there was no raw evidence presented. Iran's proxy forces could still attack U.S. interests in retaliation for Soleimani's death. But for now, U.S. President Donald Trump appears to be taking credit for calming a crisis his critics say he started in the first place. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Canadians who call the Canada Revenue Agency are waiting longer to get answers, and the information they're getting isn't always accurate or complete. Those are some of the findings of a report from an audit that was conducted last June. Elizabeth Thompson reports. It's something Canadians love to hate, waiting on hold to talk to a government official, particularly when it's a question about taxes. But according to a new report, that's what a lot of small business owners have to do when they call the Canada Revenue Agency. Last year, the CRA installed a new phone system. It was supposed to solve the problems that plagued its business call center. Busy signals, dropped calls. But a report by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business has found that while more calls are now getting through, callers have to wait a lot longer for answers. An average 15 minutes to reach a frontline agent. If you have a more complicated question and need to talk to a senior agent, be prepared to wait an hour. Even then, the audit found the CRA's employees aren't always getting it right. Corinne Pullman is the CFIB's Senior Vice President of National Affairs. She says the CRA has got a problem. We had to wait online so long to get an answer from CRA. And once you did get an answer, only about 60% of the time was the answer actually complete and correct. Now, the CRA admits it's working on its call center service, including the accuracy of the information it provides. A callback system and chatbots are just some of the things in the works to improve the way it answers tax questions. From Canadians, Elizabeth Thompson, CBC News, Ottawa. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. Okay, so let's look uh, what 48 hours hence. Uh, what do you think is going to happen, Ms. Brawlweiler? <laughs> well, it looks like 
We're in for a little bit of a break, but not from the winds. So it's going to okay. stay strong. Uh, at least the winds are going to stay strong. Not warning criteria, but strong okay. through the day. Gusty. Gusty, exactly. Let's take a look at what uh, the future tracker is saying. You can see that snow continuing along the west coast and then parts of the northeast coast as well as we head into uh, the first half of the day anyway. By the time the morning rolls around, we should actually see a little bit of a break before this next system rolls in. Going to bring some snow up through Labrador and head towards the west coast into the afternoon on Friday. But temperatures are really uh, going to drop down. You can see some snow heading towards the Avalon as well as we head into the early morning hours on Saturday. Here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise. Pretty uh, chilly, minus 8 for Corner Brook, minus 10 looks like the daytime high for Gander with some sunshine peeking out, minus 8 for St. John's, and again, still looking at that potential for some flurries pretty much across the board. Uh, minus 18 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. You're going to continue to see these cooler temperatures, sunshine up through Nain and similar temperature than Lab City sitting at minus 16. So looking ahead into Saturday, that's when that next system is moving in. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. Still looking like we could see a warm up uh, for Saturday evening as that system rolls through. But in behind that, those temperatures are going to drop and this one could bring uh, some snow through uh, most of the island. Northern Peninsula at this moment, you look like you're sitting that one out. But if that tracks any further north, you're going to see uh, some of that snow. Generally quiet through Monday up through Labrador, thanks to a ridge of high pressure and then uh, into Tuesday as well. It's actually looking pretty quiet, just some coastal flurries possible. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise by Saturday. Again, that warm up. I have the overnight low, which is actually going to be the high uh, sitting around five degrees and then dropping like a rock into Sunday. So minus four by morning and then even going to see those temperatures drop even more so with that potential for some snow and then that snow continuing into at least the first half of Monday with some sun peeking out later on in the afternoon and going down to a low near minus 10. So we should see uh, minus double digit lows. Now for central Newfoundland, uh, by Saturday, either rain or snow, and then Sunday, again, your temperatures are gonna dip overnight again into the minus teens. By Monday, we should see some sunshine in minus nine. Similar forecast for Western Newfoundland, uh, Saturday minus nine and then similar temperature for Monday with that potential for some sunshine. Eastern Labrador generally quiet. You're going to see temperatures in the minus teens right into pretty much uh, Monday and Sunday and Monday with some flurry activity in between there, but uh, plenty of sunshine for the next couple of days. And then for Western Labrador, flurries for Friday and Saturday, sunshine, but back down to the minus 30s as your overnight low. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Right, quickly, Ooh, apparently. There's, kind of uh, there's a look at your, isn't that a gorgeous shot? Misty. I now, love that photo. I think I know where this is. Okay. Well, you tell me during the break. Uh, all right, I'm just trying to take in all of its beauty. <laughs> I know, it's stunning. Sunrise or sunset? Uh, sunrise, I believe. Okay. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Welcome back. So you have a different kind of cloud to tell us about? I do. This, uh, take a look at this. It looks like a dark dancing cloud. But what you're actually looking at, there are thousands of starlings from Russia and Eastern Europe that have migrated to Israel for the winter, and they're doing apparently what is called a murmuration? Anthony, yeah. a murmuration. Yes. Everybody yes, knows teacher. this. Just kidding. <laughs> is when birds fly in swooping and intricate patterns. That's pretty incredible, eh? Yeah. Those uh, changing, shifting moves are meant to confuse the would-be attackers as well as give them safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. Also helps them find food. The number of migrating birds has dropped over the last two decades, but researchers haven't identified what's behind the decline, although when you see clouds moving like that, it doesn't look like there's been that much of a decline, but uh, certainly quite beautiful. Almost reminds me of massive schools of fish, but yeah, but in, but the, in air. the air. I yeah. know, that's beautiful. Power of numbers. That's right. It's all beautiful until it lands on you, but I digress. Uh, You're not a fan of birds? I love birds, oh, okay. so long as they're over there. Right. Not. Don't come close. Yeah, exactly. I used to have birds It's a Hitchcock thing. <laughs> really? Would you say you had a bird I used to, No, I had. I used to have two birds when I was younger. Oh, yeah? They have names? Yep, Nipper and Kiwi. Nipper and Kiwi. Tomorrow <laughs> on Here and Now, we better get to your picture. Okay. Nipper? Nipper. He okay. nipped. So okay. Nipper from Newfoundland, Kiwi was from New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand, there you go. Well, a different type of cloud, little one closer to the ground. Take a look at that gorgeous shot. Now, where is that? You North Central, Newfoundland. You were trying to decide. It's actually from Springdale. Beautiful Springdale yeah. was there recently. Yes. Gorgeous shot there. Uh, Harbor views there. Judy War 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 yeah War sent mm -hmm. us that uh, beautiful shot. Thank you so much for sending it in. If you have any you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yep. Thanks, Judy. And uh, tomorrow we'll get behind the uh, nipper and kiwi story. <laughs> okay. They're cute. <laughs> what kind they of birds were, were they? Cockatiels. Cockatiels. Okay. And they could sing. Excellent. Oh, they were so cute. All right. Nostalgia <laughs> tomorrow. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night. Nipper.